welcome everybody to the first lecture of our quantum technologies course here at ISD at the University of Lisbon, especially welcome to John Martinez from the University of California at Santa Barbara and also from Google uh, for coming here. Uh, so John is a leading expert in superconducting qubits, having uh, achieved uh, records in terms of uh, gate fidelities and, and other very important achievements in this domain. And so uh, thank you very much for coming and telling us how to you know, develop these superconducting qubits and try to build a quantum computer that's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the, the kind invitation here. I'll be giving a talk uh, this afternoon where I'm going to go into some of the um, recent experiments we've done. But what I wanted to do this morning is kind of give the background of how do we make the devices, how do we um, kind of uh, design around it, what is the basic physics. So I'm going to do that. And I'm also hoping if there are any questions, uh, you certainly will raise your hand and ask questions. And that'll, I think that'll be better to keep me at the right level and the right pace. So um, we're talking about building superconducting quantum circuits. And at Google, and, and uh, the project is really uh, uh, focused on a goal of building something useful to try to do useful calculations with this. And we're kind of thinking that the superconducting qubits at this time has really reached a mature point where we can really start focusing on doing that. Uh, I'm going to skip through a few slides and just talk about the a concept of superconducting qubits. I think everyone is familiar with the fact that um, small nanometer size scale systems like you know, atoms and molecules will obey quantum mechanics. And clearly, we needed quantum mechanics to understand how those systems work. But what's really interesting is that quantum mechanics, the phenomenon of quantum mechanics, works at a variety of different scales, a variety of different systems. And in fact, we're taking, to the, taking advantage of the fact that quantum mechanics works even for electrical circuits. Okay, This is a few hundred microns across. And when I say works for quantum mechanical circuits, uh, quantum mechanics works for electrical circuits, we have currents flowing from the ground plane here to this little cross center through these wires here. And the current in flowing in this wire is flowing both up and down at the same time in a quantum mechanical sense, just like electron orbitals has an electron at one side of the nucleus and the other at the same time. The currents here have to be described by quantum wave functions to really understand how the device is working. And what's nice about, of course, building an electrical uh, uh, system is we can, it's big, we can bring in wires and we can control it very precisely. So it's large size scale, uh, which is kind of unusual that a quantum mechanical object is something that are hundreds of microns across. This allows us to use integrated circuit technology to make a qubit, make re step and repeat, and make hundreds or thousands or millions eventually of qubits, uh, and then be able to control it in a nice way. So that's kind of the reason uh, we think this is this is very exciting for the future. Is that we know how to uh, we think we know how to scale up to make very complex systems. Um, I'm going to uh, start. Uh, with discussion of harmonic oscillator. Okay, these electrical circuits are uh, linear circuits. You can build oscillators out of it. That's described by harmonic oscillator physics. So I'm going to review that, and then I'm going to show you how we use some nonlinearity of the Josephson junction to make interesting qubit states and to do that. But let's, we have to review harmonic oscillators, okay? So in physics, we study harmonic oscillators all the time, starting from the freshman physics, or maybe even before that. Um, and what we have is, uh, let's say, a mass on a spring, or in this case, we'll be talking about inductor capacitor resonators, things like photons, traveling uh, electromagnetic waves of light, or phonons, are all described with a harmonic oscillator. And what the physicists do, of course, we talk about this in terms of a Hamiltonian or energy that's uh, momentum squared plus position squared or charge squared plus flux squared or electric field squared plus magnetic field squared. These quadratic forms of the Hamiltonian 
gives you a, what is we call a linear system. So if you drive the system twice as hard, then the amplitude gets twice as big. So in the response, uh, in the response is linear in that sense. Now to understand what's going on with the harmonic oscillator, we can use a phase-space diagram where we have, let's say, position and momentum or velocity for a, a, a mass on a spring, or it could be flux and charge for an inductor capacitor resonator. And classically, we could represent the state of the system in position and momentum as a, as a point in the phase space. And of course, with this system oscillating here, you'll have a harmonic oscillator motion with x going up or down, or in the phase space, we'll have this oscillating around in time in a circle given by this, with the oscillation frequency omega given by k over m, or for a harmonic oscillator, one over square root of LC. So that's the basic dynamics of the system, classical dynamics. What you can do to kind of simplify what's going on here is work in a rotating frame where these axes are rotating around at omega zero. And in that case, the, the state of the system is stationary in time. And of course, with the rotation of the frame, you can see the rotation of the real uh, uh, real motion. And what we're going to do is we're just going to call this the state of the system at, at a point in time with the coordinate alpha, which has both real and imaginary components. And of course, that the point in the rotating frame is, is uh, staying at a constant point. Now, if you want to talk about quantum mechanics of a harmonic oscillator, you solve the system. And uh, uh, you can solve for the various eigenstates of the system. But the interesting thing is, in the quantum case, the ground state zero is, of course, with a real and imaginary part of alpha equals zero. But you can think in this phase space a picture that there's some width to this Gaussian, both in position and in momentum, or this real and imaginary alpha in the rotating frame, with the area of this given by h bar over 2. And what's interesting about the quantum system is that if you take the, the, the quantum description and you start driving it with the force, so you have the mass and you're pushing it, and you look at the dynamics of this, it turns out the dynamics of this system is exactly the same as what you expect for a classical system. So you get the classical trajectory, only in this phase space you have this displaced state displaced ground state that's moving around in time. In the, in the non-rotating frame, it would move around here, and in this rotating frame, it's just, uh, just constant. And for example, if you start out in the ground state, and you push it like you would for a classical system, this alpha state here that describes the quantum state just moves uh, here, the, the amplitude gets bigger and bigger. And what's in fact very interesting, if you have a real system with dissipation, which all systems do, then this will just relax over time to the ground state, as you expect classically, and of course what you expect quantum mechanically. And of course this coherent state that's oscillating around here for the case of light fields is just the coherent state of the laser that is, you know, used the, um, and of course it describes a classical oscillator too. So the thing I want to kind of remind everyone in, in, in this is that the response of this system, the quantum response and the classical response is the same, which is maybe what you expect, but it's the same. The only difference maybe is that the state of the system is this uh, Gaussian kind of wave packet. So that if you were trying to do some measurements, you would see the center of this moving around in the right way, but you might see a little bit of an imprecision in the position uh, because of the, the uncertainty. But essentially, the, the response of the system, the quantum is classic. Okay. So that's, uh, that's all um, uh, kind of straightforward uh, system uh, uh, description for a linear system. What gets interesting in quantum systems is when you actually probe them in some nonlinear way, okay? And the classic way to think about this is instead of probing what the charge and, uh, charge and flux is or position and momentum, you probe what the energy is. 
which is uh, you know q, uh, which is p squared plus x squared, okay, quadratic. And you know that if you um, uh, look at the energy of photons, some interesting things happen. And this was first discovered, of course, in the Planck radiation law, the infrared radiation. To understand the particular shape of the curve, you had to invoke uh, quantum mechanics that the energy, photon energy, comes in wave packets, in, in packets of, of quantum of energy. Now that derivation is kind of complicated, of course, historically that's how this was first understood. But what's very nice is modern experiments allow you to see that physics in a very dramatic and simple way. So you're absolutely confronted with the fact there's quantum phenomena. So I want to describe this. I was in fact involved in this when I was working at uh, NIST in the uh, early 2000s uh, with uh, Sei Wunan. And the experiment is very simple. You take uh, uh, let's say a laser diode that's emitting at 1556 nanometer and you pulse it on for about a nanosecond or so so you have a, a, a packet of light energy with a certain amount of energy. At room temperature it's enormous. And then you put a bunch of attenuators in that so it attenuates it down so that that pulse of light has just a, a couple of photons of energy. In this case it's about 2.5 photons of energy on average. Okay, that's a clearly classical calculation. You have so much energy to begin with, and you attain doing it back down. And then you have that light connecting to an energy detector. In this case, it's something called a microcalorimeter. And what this does is it operates at about 100 millikelvin, and it has a very small metal electrode, about 10 microns across, so it can absorb the light just fine. And what happens with that is when it absorbs the light, the temperature goes up and then decays back down, which you can see in these scope traces. It absorbs the photon, the temperature goes up, uh, and then it goes back down over a few microseconds. And the heat capacity and the noise of the system is small, small enough so you can measure the temperature very accurately as it goes up and down to the force. And of course, the temperature rise is proportional to energy. It's just temperature times heat capacity is energy. Now when you look at these heat pulses, sometimes you see nothing. Sometimes you see something right here. This is, you can see a bunch of traces here. And then every once in a while you see a trace here and then a trace here. So this is a, just a scope photo of about 30 traces or so. You then say, well, what is the energy of each of these pulses by just taking the, the top value here? And you histogram that for thousands of points. And you see these peaks here, corresponding to one photon being absorbed, or two photons, or three, or four, or five. And you have a Poisson distribution, as you expect quantum mechanically, from this packet of light. So on average, if you average all this, you might get 2.4 photons. But any individual packet, you'll see the quantized energy of, of light. Okay. And this is what's going on in the Planck radiation law. It's just you're integrating over all the modes, and it's hard to actually see it. But for modern detectors, you definitely can see the fact that energy is quantized in light by h bar omega. This is just what you see in the light. And what's happening here is that you're measuring this with a nonlinear detector. It's an energy detector. It's, again, it's not measuring x or p. It's measuring x squared plus p squared which is a nonlinear detector. So it turns out that for a harmonic oscillator, if you do a linear detection, it's all kind of classical light. But if you do something nonlinear, you really see the quantum mechanical nature of it. And people take advantage of that with phosphon sleeve states and Rindledown and kind of microwave cavities, superducting qubits. Uh, they use nonlinearities of qubits or detectors or pumping systems to take advantage of seeing the quantum nature of the light. And in fact, we're going to be using some nonlinear elements to see the quantum nature of, of this system. And that's kind of one of the, the big, uh, big things we're going to uh, focus on. Now, I'm going to go down to this particular uh, diagram here uh, to try to talk about uh, uh, this. Again, we're going to talk about the, this, this, the geometry of the harmonic oscillator. This is the real part of alpha. This is the imaginary count of alpha, 
It's initially in the ground state. This is a plane. And then as we start driving the harmonic oscillator by pushing it, okay, uh, on resonance, then the, 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 it'll start to oscillate back and forth. And we describe this by an alpha, okay, or, uh, which is the, the um, you know, total amplitude of the drive. And depending on the phase of the drive, alpha would be anywhere here. And we'll describe the quantum state as a real and imaginary part of alpha. So this part is given by the phase of the drive, and alpha is kind of the total integrated force over time. So it's basically the, uh, the oscillating force integrated over time gives you the amplitude of this form. So that's just what I've talked about before. Now that's for a harmonic oscillator, and the quantum system has an equally spaced energy level for the quantum harmonic oscillator. And what happens is when you drive the harmonic oscillator, you're making transitions between the zero and one, but because all these other transition frequencies are the same, you're making the transition between zero, one, one to two, two, three, going up and down. And the longer you drive this, the more transitions you're getting through here, and then the energy of the system goes up and up over time. And of course, you're in a quantum superposition of the different states here. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening quantum mechanically. Now, what's interesting what we're trying to do here is we're going to take this harmonic oscillator system and what happens when you chop off all these other energy levels? And we'll describe how to do that in a minute. So this having only two levels is in fact a totally nonlinear system now. So a qubit is a two-level system, it's totally nonlinear. And when you chop off these other levels, um, very different things happen, but in some sense it's kind of similar to a harmonic oscillator, and I want to kind of talk about that. First of all, before, as you were driving transitions, you can drive all these other transitions, and the energy can just go up over time. But now what's going to happen is you're going to drive a transition from zero to one, but then you're going to drive a transition from one to zero. It's going to stay in these states. And it turns out that the dynamics of the two-state system, instead of being described by a plane for a harmonic oscillator, it's now described by a sphere, which is called the block sphere. And I, I imagine some of you, has, have people understood the block sphere, or do I, I, I need to review that some? Okay, so I'll review it, okay? But uh, so basically what happens is, the state space is now described where if you're up here on the sphere, it's zero, and it's down here, it's on a one. If you're out here, you're zero plus one. This is zero plus I one. Zero minus I one. Uh, zero minus one, zero minus I one. This kind of represents all the possible states in the block sphere. And then what happens is, instead of you living on a plane, you're living on a sphere. And the geometry is such that now when you drive it, instead of going on the plane, you're going along the surface of the sphere. And you're going from a zero state to zero plus one to a one state, and then back, back and forth. So it's, in fact, the, the behavior is kind of the same. You're just driving and moving it on this, but the geometry of space that you live in is different, and you get extremely different and interesting behavior. Okay, so let me explain how that works if people aren't familiar with the block sphere. This is kind of an interesting uh, thing to do it. So the physics of the two-level system, the mathematics is that you have, uh, let's say, a spin in a magnetic field. You have uh, the, the energy, the Hamiltonian, is given by uh, the poly matrix e sigma uh, multiplied by the magnetic field, okay? So here's the poly matrix sigma x with ones on the diagonal, sigma y minus i and i, and sigma z one and minus one. And this is multiplied by the magnetic field in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. Okay? So uh, let's talk about the, the quantum mechanics of, of this. If you have bx and by is equal to zero, so we only have b in the z direction, okay? Then you have this diagonal matrix times bz, and clearly the eigenstates of the system, because it's diagonal, is just that you're either in the zero state or the one state. 
So in astronomy Z, we say that these two energy levels are split by mu B times Bz, proportional Bz. The lower energy is the ground state, higher energy is the, is the wet state. Okay, so this is a, a two-level state physics. Now what's interesting about the two-level state physics is we can write the wave function, the quantum mechanical description of this, as some amplitude times the zero state plus some amplitude and phase times the one state in general. And what you can do is you can show pictorially uh, um, represent that state as a vector on a sphere, as I was talking about a few minutes ago. So what happens is, is if this vector is pointing up in the z direction, then theta equals zero, and cosine of zero is one, and sine of zero is zero, so that's in the ground state. If this is pointing in this direction, then theta equals pi over two, and this is cosine of pi over two, which is uh, one over root two, and then this sine of this is one over root two, so it's equal superposition of zero plus one, and the normalization factors are equals correct. But then we have this additional kind of degree of freedom, which is the phase of the one wave function, which is represented by the state, this vector pointing in all these directions here, here. Okay. And then uh, clearly, uh, when uh, theta is equal to pi, cosine of pi over two is zero, sine of pi over two is one, and the psi is in the one state. So this is very nice because you have a geometrical picture of the state just like we have with the harmonic oscillator. And this is really nice because when we're trying to understand what's going on, you can kind of picture this geometrically and you can kind of understand what's going on. And in fact, the dynamics of the system is really straightforward to understand uh, 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 in this. And I'll just explain that right now. So um, if you're in some state here and you have a strong magnetic field Vz in the z direction, the energy of one state is higher than the zero, so that you're going to have an oscillating term from the Schrodinger equation of e to the minus i e one zero t over h bar. So this block vector here is actually uh, versus time rotating around uh, in this direction with that phase factor, and that's the standard phase factor you'll see in the, the, the quantum mechanics. Okay. When, um, uh, if you want to know the eigenstates of the system, of course they're zero and one, and that's with the block vector pointing up for the ground state and one in the minus state. And note that those pointing directions are in the direction of the BZ control field, like the BZ is big and BX and BY are zero. So it's kind of interesting that the eigenstates description here is pointing in the same direction as the B field. And that's actually a general property I don't emphasize that in a second. What we can do is we can move to a rotating frame, just like we did for the harmonic oscillator. So you have the block vector, it's ro rotating around in time like this. So you, I take my frame and I rotate it around at the same frequency as the block vector. And then that's nice because this is stationary in time, okay? And if this is stationary in time, that rotating frame means that, well, it's, if it's not rotating, E10 has to be zero, and that effectively takes the BZ term uh, away uh, to zero. So you can, you can, by doing this rotating frame, you can, uh, you can remove uh, that uh, BZ component. And then, of course, the physics gets, uh, gets simple. Okay, just like in the harmonic oscillator, instead of it rotating around, you move the rotating frame, it's a it's in one direction. It's kind of easier to picture what's happening over time. Um, the last thing to mention is that if we want to measure the qubit state, how much zero and how much one, of course, that's just cosine squared of theta over two for the zero, sine squared of theta over two. And that particular measurement is just the projection of this block vector on the z-axis. So it's kind of this length divided by two. So that if in your the zero state, the length is two divided by one, which is one. And if you're in the one state, the length is zero. And the probability would be the ground state is zero. So you can picture all that. Okay? Good. Now let's go on.
And I just want to say, what happens with the system if you have an arbitrary bx and by and bz, not just the bz b in the z direction? So I'm going to write another sphere here, which is the control field sphere. So there's a component of bx in this direction, and by in this direction, bz, and the total b field is the length here. And it turns out, and this is great if you ever fit and hit an exam question on how a quantum two-level state works, this is how you remember what the answer is. Okay, so this is useful for you students. And what it turns out to be is that when you have a B field control field in this direction, the eigenstates of the system in the block sphere are the exact same direction as this. Okay, so once you know theta and you know the, the formula for the wave function, you can compute all the eigenstates. And if you want to know what the eigenvalues are, it's just proportional to the magnitude of this B. So it's Bx squared plus By squared plus Bz squared square root. And then if there's a plus eigenvalue and a minus eigenvalue. Okay, so what's the derivation of this? Okay, you know that when we do the quantum mechanics, we choose a z direction, which is arbitrary, but usually it's done because of some other symmetry. But you know, what we can do is when we take this problem right here, we can just take the, the z direction in line with our control vector. Let's just change, you know, change directions of our, our z axis. And we know that the physics shouldn't depend on how we choose our coordinate system. And of course, if you choose in this direction, you get the results of the last time, which is that the eigenstates are proportional to this vector length, the eigenvalues, and the eigenstates are, you know, 0 and 1. So you just, you know, take all the results of the last one and put it in there and you're done. So this is really kind of a useful, uh, useful thing. The other useful thing is remember in the last slide, I said that when you have a, a B field in the Z direction, this rotated around at E10 T over H bar at that frequency. It means that now with a, a, a B field control in this direction, and you have a, 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 a block vector pointing away from this direction, the time dynamics will be to rotate around that eigenvector with this frequency. Okay? So this is really useful. This is, this is how you geometric view of this. The energy is the length of the control vector. The eigenstates are in the direction of the control vector. And if the particular state is not in the direction of the eigenstate, it's just going to rotate around, uh, uh, around the eigenstate vector versus time. And then you know what the time dependence is, given, given those facts. And this is really neat about the, uh, the, the qubit two-level system, as you can kind of geometrically understand what's going on. Okay. So again, I hope that helps you, helps you on some kind of exam question, you know, two quantum two-level state. You should be able to just really almost see it in your mind. Once you do this for a while, we've been doing, you just know what the answer is without even thinking. Okay, maybe you have to do a little bit of math to get it right, but you can see what's going on. Okay, so that really makes the, the quantum mechanics not too hard to understand, at least for a two-level system. And this is really great because we want to have a very simple and clear picture. Okay? Good. Any questions there? Okay, we'll just do something a little bit more complicated. Okay, so now what we're going to do with this kind of, with this kind of um, um, a picture, uh, let's talk about what's, gonna, what's the dynamics of the system. Okay, so we're going to have a two-level system with a big B field, okay, and then we're going to change the B field in the Z direction just by a small amount. Okay, so we have some offset here, we're going to change it by a small amount, and of course the energy of the one state is going to go up and down proportional to this, okay. So um, what's happening here is this is accumulating some phase versus time, and then if we have a little blip here, it's going to accumulate phase as a, as a faster rate uh, during this little time here. So if you kind of say, okay, let's go into the rotating frame where at this particular B field, 
we've gone into a rotating frame where this is stationary. And you just want to know what is the change of what happened when you put in then that blip of the B field. Then uh, that's just, is just going to cause this to rotate around here a little bit during the time that's on. Okay, this is just this, this picture I just talked about example. Everyone okay with that? Questions? Okay. Now, with the B field in the Z direction, things are easy because you have, uh, you know, the, the, the operator here for BZ is diagonal. So all you have to do is uh, just compute what is the phase uh, accumulated by this little B field here. So that phase is just uh, delta BZ integrated with time, it's just the area under this here with the, uh, uh, in units of H bar. Okay, so it's going to pick up some phase. So that means after this blip, instead of this going here, it's going to be in some other angle where it picked up some phase that's calculated by that. Okay? And I'm just going to write that the fact that the state picked up some phase as a Z, because we're controlling the Z direction by some phase. Okay? And so I'm, I'm kind of writing this in some control notation. And I, I, let me, let me uh, step back for a second to describe kind of why I'm doing this. And this is harking back to building electrical circuits and electronic gates and whatever. If we have classical bits and we're building some electronics like this, okay, you have a zero state or a one state, okay, I'm just zero or a one state, classical state, and if you put it through an inverter circuit made out of some CMOS transistors, okay, you know from the inverter the zero goes to a one and the one state goes to a zero. Okay? And you get some transformation properties which we call as the operator knot. Okay? And uh, if you, uh, for example, have what's called a buffer circuit, it actually does nothing. Zero, one goes to zero, one. And we can call that the identity. Okay? Now, there are nice relationships in classical um, a circuit theory about how you put together gates. When you're just talking about a single, cube, single bit gate, the, um, uh, the only interesting thing you can do at all is have two not gates. Okay? So a zero goes to one and one goes to zero, and a one goes to zero and one goes to one. Okay? And you see that the not gate is equal to, this is equal to a buffer gate. So we have a relationship, a not times a, a not times a not is equal to identity. Okay, it's kind of the algebra of single bit logic. Okay. What I'm trying to do here is work out the logic of quantum gates. And given that you have a, both an amplitude and phase, these relationships are going to be much more complicated. It's much richer. In fact, that's kind of what's cool about the quantum systems. You can do that richness here. So this is an example of this kind of relationship for the Z gate. We have one gate, we put in a blip here, we get some phase. Let's say we put in a second blip here, okay, which is Z2. So the first one, Z, we rotate by alpha, and we put another one, Z, which we rotate by beta. If we have a phase of alpha, the first one, and a phase of beta, the next one, then the total response to this system is just alpha flow theta, right? You just add the phases. Just, you know, just saying it's the area. You can see from the integral that has to be true, okay? So in the Z gate, it has this little bit more complicated, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's more complicated than that, but there's a relationship for putting on uh, an extra phase, okay? Now let's do something more complicated. That was the simple one. Now we're going to put on microwaves at the transition frequency. 
So if, if we put a microwave just right, that zero can go to a one, which is kind of like a knot, right? And then we put on a second microwave pulse, and if you're in the one state, that takes you to the zero. And that's kind of like a knot, knot is equal to i. So we're going to kind of build this gate using microwave pulses. Okay, but it's richer because it's quantum mechanics. Okay, so how do you think about microwave pulses? And, you know, of course, the obvious thing is that we know from basic quantum mechanics, when you have an energy level of two different uh, states, which are due to the BZ field, if we put a, some microwaves, photons, at that energy difference, we'll get a transition. So we expect something here. But how do you see that in the system? Okay, so the way you see that is you imagine um, you're in a, um, uh, what you imagine is you're putting on a BX or BY field. This is, you have a big BZ field, you have a small BX or BY, and you're putting that at an oscillating uh, frequency that corresponds to this transition frequency, okay? And in this case, what we're going to do in terms of BX and BY it's going to oscillate by just rotating around in time between Bx and Dy. So it's Bx cosine omega t plus i Dy sine omega, and Dy goes to sine omega t. So it oscillates around in time. Now what we're going to do is go to the rotating frame. And remember I said in the rotating frame, this, this is not moving. So that's equivalent to setting BZ is equal to zero. But now if you have a BX and BY that's moving like this, and your frame is moving like that, that's like that if there's a B field of constant magnitude and direction versus time. So in that axis, in that rotating frame, we have BZ and B, let's say BY is zero, the phase is, is, uh, is zero and we have a, a B field in the X direction. So if B field is in the X direction, here, and you have a state vector that's say in the zero state, it wants to rotate around this axis, right? And that will take a zero state to here, to a one state, to, you know, um, zero plus I1 back to the zero state. It's gonna rotate between the zero state and one state which corresponds to making a transition from here to here and back down again. Okay with that? And you can work out the math of that, okay, which just says that this, uh, or, or and what happens is, if you have a phase equals zero, then in the rotating frame, the B, F, the B field is in this direction. If you phase shift that drive by 90 degrees, then instead of in the rotating frame it being this direction, it's in this direction, and then you're going to rotate around this axis. So let's just talk about the Y gate growing here, which goes from 0 to 0 plus 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 minus 1, and back to 0. And if you just, just like with the Z field, you can define an angle, which is just the area of this, this control field in time, just like the Z. And then you're going to put these into the angles here, and you can just see that this transformation tells you what goes on with the block vector over time. It's just the math that it's saying. It's just, this is the mathematical algebraic statement of saying that the block vector is moving around like that. Right? So you're changing the 0 and 1 components. Okay, It's just like the Z-gate, only it's a different direction. Questions on that? Okay, so now it's just like in the Z gate, if you rotate around the X direction for, for angle alpha and you do a second pulse in the beta direction, they just sum up. And the same thing in the Y directions, they sum up. Okay, we well, should expect. But now if you rotate in the X direction around here and you rotate in the Y direction because they're at different angles on the sphere, it's going to do something more complicated. It turns out you just have to work it out. It turns out that x by a pi rotation and a y, you so if you rotate around in x direction by this, 
and then y direction by this, it turns out that that's equivalent to a z rotation by pi. So rotating around different axes, it's, it like depends on the order, it gets complicated, but you can work it out, okay? And the same, and you can make a very general statement by rotation around an A axis by alpha, followed by a B, a rotation around the B axis by beta, is equivalent to the rotation about a C axis by gamma. You just have to compute it in some complicated way. Okay. But this is very nice. It's very much like this statement. You see, the application of two gates is equivalent to the application of one gate. Okay? So it means that if you have a series of these one qubit operations, you can always mathematically reduce it to one rotation. So you can compress it down. Okay? But it's just complicated. Okay. So, again, we're trying to develop a, a electrical engineering kind of language to describe this. So if we have some complicated sequence, we kind of know how to deal with it. Okay, so the thing going back to this, note that this y gate by pi takes a 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. So this looks like a not gate. It's just the quantum version of the not gate here. So you can do classical logic, okay, if we wanted to. Build a quantum computer and do classical logic if we want to just restrict ourselves to this. Okay, and again, this is nothing but saying Put on the microwave pulse, you do a transition from 0 to 1. You put on another pulse, it's 1 to 0. You can make transitions up and down, which again is you know, for standard quantum theory. Okay? And then just to follow this up, instead of putting the B field that rotates in time this way, it's much more convenient. Then you have to have a B field in the X and Y direction, and that's more complicated. What you could do is just have the B field oscillating in the X direction as cosine of omega T. Okay, that's much more convenient. And you can write cosine as e to the I omega T plus e to the minus I omega T. And you see that one of those e to the I omega T is on resonance with the rotating frame, so all these wonderful things happen. This other term in minus I omega T, this is going this way, uh, the, the, that frame is going this way, they're off resonance by 2 omega t. Since it's off resonant, nothing is going to happen. And in fact, by, make, by shaping the pulse just modestly, then you, you never see this off resonance term. So this counter driven term, off resonant term, you don't have to worry about. And it's just as you can just uh, excite this by just having B change in the x direction. Note that the, the uh, uh, Bx doesn't, you know, or very, very Bx or By doesn't matter. It's the phase of the excitation that determines this phase right here. And that's how you control this angle. Okay? So the final thing is what happens instead of driving it on resonance, you drive it slightly off resonance. Okay? And in that case, this Bz field isn't actually absolutely canceled out. There's a little bit of BZ term in this way. And that means that your rotation axis, instead of being an equatorial plane, is slightly different. And that way, that means you're going to rotate not from 0 to 1, but some rotate number, some, some other angle. So, for example, if BZ is tuned so this eigenstates are at 45 degrees here, okay, then you're going to, this state is going to rotate from here to the equator and back, okay? And that gives you more general gates that you can do. So you can change that with the frequency, okay? So in fact, uh, you know, okay, so that's the theoretical concept of what we do. What do we do in an experiment? What we do is we have a decay to the zero state, and then we put on a microwave pulse to do, you know, one of these rotations. Okay, and we, you know, if there's the frequency and there's the amplitude and the time, we can adjust all that. And then at the end, we measure whether we're in the zero or one state. And hopefully I'll get to that, how we do that. And this is the theoretical graph, but it tells you what goes on here. If you're exactly on resonance, frequency detuning is zero. As you make this longer and longer, 
you see this oscillation, this line right here, which are called Rabi oscillations, where you oscillate between uh, being in the zero state. And now at this point here, the probability of the zero state is zero, so you're in the one state. And then you go back to zero, one, zero, one. And this is just the Rabi oscillations I was talking about. If you're off resonance, then you don't, uh, um, you kind of oscillate at a, some angle with, with respect to uh, the equator, and then you're going to go from zero to zero plus one. So the oscillations aren't as big. And because you have a detuning component, you have your drive component and the detuning component, the drive vector is bigger, and then the frequency goes up here. So that's why these, you go from zero to something to zero again, it's faster because um, you have an energy from the detuning. Okay. So this is actually the curve we measure in our experiment. We change the frequency, we change the time, and then we can tune up everything by looking at this. So we find with maximum oscillation uh, amplitude tells us when we're off resonance with our device, and then the shape of all this gives us all the parameters. So we can, you know, tune up our device by looking at this. We know everything. We don't a priori know what it is. And, you know, for example, it turns out that any, any combination of frequency detuning and time here gives you whatever arbitrary rotation you would ever want. You just have to kind of calibrate this section. And this particular point here is the Hadamard, which takes a zero to zero plus one and a zero minus one to one. So that's a particularly useful gate that you see in quantum computing literature. But that all can be too many. Okay? So questions on that? Okay, good. Yeah, this is kind of basic two-level quantum physics. And uh, um, I, we, we trying to build kind of a very geometrical and intuitive way as possible to understand how that works. And then, like we said here, for a harmonic oscillator, you live in a plane. For a um, two-level state, you live in a sphere. And it turns out if you drive it for a certain amplitude and a certain time that takes you from here to here, this is the amplitude of the drive. For the block sphere, if you were to do the same thing in this system instead of this system, you move the same distance on the block sphere alpha Okay, but now it's curved. So the, the physics, the movement of these vectors in, on these surfaces is really the same whether you're driving a harmonic oscillator. Same rotating frames, all the physics is the same, except that for the qubit you live on a sphere, and for a harmonic oscillator you live on a plane. It's just the geometry that's different, but all the dynamics is really the same. So this is why it's kind of useful to think about harmonic oscillators and qubits in terms of response to a drive. It, it really gives you a good intuition of what's going on. I understand it might be hard here once you do the experiments where this is really, really helpful. Okay. So that's the kind of the basic harmonic oscillator in qubit physics. Now we're going to talk about superinducting qubits, okay? So these are some uh, macroscopic atoms where the current and voltages are good quantum variables, okay? And things kind of work because their oscillation frequency, about 5 gigahertz, is much greater than 20 millikelvin, the temperatures we're working at. So if you remember, 20 gigahertz is a kelvin, so this energy is about a... a uh, about uh, 5 gigahertz is about 200 millikelvin, and 200 millikelvin is much bigger than 20 millikelvin. So our states really can go to the ground states, you know, with very little error. And this is nice because 5 gigahertz is a not too hard microwave frequency, and your cell phones are operating at that frequency roughly. So there's lots of cheap equipment around there to do things. And 20 millikelvin, you have to buy an expensive dilution refrigerator. But once you do that, you just can get the low temperatures easily. It's, that's not the problem. And like I said, we can make linear oscillators 
Okay? We can make an inductor capacitor resonator. Um, you can also make um, other kind of resonators. In this case, these are um, transmission line resonators, which is nothing, it's nothing different than like a, a resonator made with a piano string. Right? You have a string and fix the two ends, and you know that you have oscillation modes that are at lambda over two, and at lambda, and the like. And what we do is we just make a wire, and we'll typically embed that in the ground plane. So the ground plane's here, and the wire's here, and you can make a lambda over two resonator out of it, okay? where, it, yeah, this is half the wavelength. And that, it, it's very easy using microwave circuit techniques, is you can, uh, uh, you can understand that as an inductor capacitor resonator. So there's microwave techniques that basically take this and it gives you, you get an equivalent inductor and an equivalent capacitor. Okay. Now, of course, oh, I know what I wanted to say. Okay, now let's talk about a nonlinear inductor. Okay, let's go back to this guy. Okay. I told you we got to this state here by chopping off all these states in the harmonic oscillator. So how do we do that? How can I get rid of all those other higher energy level harmonic oscillator states? Okay, you know, you just can't magically chop them off. So there's a very nice trick. And the trick is that you make a nonlinear oscillator. Okay? And the nonlinear oscillator means that the oscillator frequency will change as you get the higher and higher energies. Okay? So that this, as it changes, the second state you see is lower than this, and the third state is lower than this. And now if you drive it with a, a long microwave signal, that's resonant with this, this signal here is off resonant here and it won't drive it. And you'll just stay within these two states. There's other states there, but they're off resonant and you won't see them. Okay. So we have to build a nonlinear oscillator to be able to do this, create this. This is the, and you know most, if you look at most qubits, they're actually multi-level systems and it's only between two of the states that you drive transitions and you make something. So this is very, very typical in what everyone's doing. Okay. Now, if you want to build a nonlinear oscillator, okay, out of you know conventional electrical components, that's not too hard to do. You just get a physical inductor capacitor and you drive it really hard, and slightly before the time when it begins to smoke, okay, with all that power, something goes wrong and you see nonlinearity. So nonlinear is, is seen in physical systems all the time at high power. Okay. The problem here is you have to see something nonlinear with one photon of energy. Okay. Way before you know, something bad happens to the physics. Okay. So this is, this is the trick. Is, okay, can nature give you that nonlinearity? And the answer is beautiful in, the, in that we can build, use something called a Joseph's injunction which is a not, has a huge nonlinear inductance even with a tiny amount of energy in it. And to boot, it's very, very low loss. Okay, it's not like you drive something to a lot of power just before it smokes. It's dissipating a lot of power at that point. The physics of the Josephson effect gives you extremely low loss and nonlinear. So it's a gift from nature. This is why we can do it. And I'll just, you know, you can take a TEM of your Joseph's injunction, and we make it by evaporating aluminum in a vacuum system. We then put in a little bit of oxygen, and the aluminum wants to react with the oxygen uh, very rapidly, so you form an insulator aluminum oxide of about a one or two nanometer stick. Okay, that's a barrier to current flow. Uh, and then you put evaporated aluminum on top, and this is so thin that electrons can tunnel through, okay, and make this Joseph's injunction. And uh, it turns that gives you the nonlinear behavior. So it turns out, and I'll explain this, it turns out that if you get a cosine potential,
for the um, uh, energy versus essentially flux. So instead of having a parabola here for the energy of an inductor, you use a Joseph's inductance and you have a cosine potential. And see it's softening here, you're getting lower frequencies. And then the energy level separation between here and here is not the same as this. And we can, you can build this nonlinearity. Okay? So I'll explain that next. But that's where we're going here. Okay? Uh, so this, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, these are about harmonic oscillators. Uh, yeah, let, just before I do that, uh, I have to explain this. I just want to review the quantum harmonic oscillator for just a second. I'm sorry, I didn't quite sequence this right, but this is, this is fine. Okay, so we have, so just going back to harmonic oscillator, but this will be useful. Um, when we write the harmonic oscillator, the energy is E squared over 2C and flux squared over 2L. Okay, that's the classical energy or Hamiltonian of the system. And then to do the quantum mechanics, we have to turn these things into operators that are the canonically conjugate operators, charge and flux or position of momentum. So to turn it into quantum mechanics, we just put little hats over there, right? So that's quantum now, right? So there's hats here. And the important thing is that there's a commutation relationship between position and momentum or flux and charge so that the commutation relation is IH bar. Okay. So this is all obtained in the same way that you would do with a regular uh, harmonic oscillator. You have the energy of the components, you write the Lagrangian, find the coordinates, you turn <coughs> to the Hamiltonian from the canonic to conjugate uh, uh, coordinates you get the commutation relation, okay? You just crank through this, and you just trust the fact that you know this works for atoms and, you know, microscopic system, and you just trust that it works for electrical circuits too, okay? It's not obvious that it will, but what we find in nature that if you build the systems right, it works too. It's kind of amazing that you just crank through the machinery and everything. Now you go through and you solve the harmonic oscillator, and you have raising and lowering operators, which A uh, takes a one st a state n to state n minus one, and A dagger A plus goes from state n to state n plus one. And you can write the flux operators as a zero point flux times these dimensionless raising and lowering operators, okay? And again, I, 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 this is a trick, if you're in an exam, and they have a harmonic oscillator problem for you. You can hopefully remember this, but if you're like me, you'll never remember what these numbers are. They're just, you know, okay, how, how do you do it? And it's very easy to remember how to calculate these. It's just that the zero point flux and charge, you just take the energy of the flux squared over 2L or Q squared over 2C, and you set them equal to 1 quarter h bar omega so that this plus this is equal to zero point energy one half h bar omega, which kind of makes sense, okay? So you just take the, the zero point energy half h bar omega and split it between the two modes and you get these constants. So you just write that down. Okay, that's really, that's great for me. I can remember that. Okay. And then of course, uh, when you have a quantum system or any, even a classical system, you have parameters C and L Okay, and uh, a, a C and L can be converted into a, a frequency omega zero, uh, which is the energy level spacing, which is one over root LC. Okay, we all can remember this, square root of K over M for mass and spring. But there's a, that's only one parameter, frequency. The other parameter that is important is the impedance of the device, which uh, is Z zero, do I have it? I don't have it anything written down here. Um, the impedance of the device is 1 over omega 0 C or omega 0 L. Okay? And in electrical circuits, we're always thinking about the impedance and the frequency. Okay? 
Now, it turns out the, so, and then you can write the zero point fluctuations in terms of a flux quantum or the charge uh, fluctuations in terms of 2e. Those are kind of the natural units in our system. And you just work out the constants. And it turns that these are ratios of the impedance of the device divided by the resistance quantum, 25 kilohms. And typically, when you build electrical circuits, these impedances are about the free space impedance. Okay? So the ratio between this and this is roughly 1 over 137. Okay? So nature, you know, uh, has the free space impedance much less than this. It's alpha constant. And that means that this quantity here is about a tenth of a phi-naught. And that the charge fluctuations <laughs> are usually about 10 times 2 e. Just for typical things. You can build resonators that have different impedances and the like. But, you know, those just give you kind of reasonable numbers. Okay, just so that you can kind of get some physics intuition of what's going on. Okay. But this is nice. You know how to plug in things. Okay, so let's go to the, the transmon. So this is the design of the circuit. And here's the circuit model. Okay, and here, the, in white is the ground plane, and in black are cups in the ground plane where there's no metal. So we have a big ground plane around everything here, which we write as ground, okay? We have an island here, this metal island here, which has capacitance from here to the ground plane, which I write as a self-capacitance C. That's part of our inductor capacitor resonator. We have Josephson junctions down here, okay? And these junctions are form a inductor L with either Josephson junction. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. This gives us an LC resonator. And the Josephson junctions are nonlinear, and again, I'll explain that, okay? And then if I want to push the system, I want to drive some microwaves to make a transition, I do that by bringing a voltage in here and then there's a capacitance from here to here, okay, which is given by this capacitance here. And that allows me to, to push the system and drive it to see the transition. Okay. So um, in terms of the, the, the Z operators that I was talking about uh, uh, previously, for the AC drives, this is like a B of X and B of Y, right, where you can drive the microwaves. And it turns out by putting a current into here, into this two-junction loop, that can change the effective critical current and the effective inductance here, which changes the oscillation frequency. So this current here allows me to change the frequency of the qubit. And I'm not going to go into how two junctions change the critical current, but if you look in, uh, like Cattell, a standard the cadets matter, physics book that describes, you know, uh, uh, describes uh, superconductivity, the math is really pretty simple, but I'm just not going to go into that. Okay. But that changes the frequency. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to treat this as one junction where we can tune its parameters with the skirt, and we're going to talk about how that works. Okay. How, in particular, I want to talk about how, how is this a nonlinear So this is the math to do that. And up until now, I think I've mostly been giving you geometric measurements. <coughs> so let's do some math, OK? Um, I, guess, I guess that would be good. But again, I'm trying to give you a geometrical picture of what's going on. Now, I'm going to give you a very quick review of superconductivity to understand this. OK. So you have a metal. And you have electron traveling in the metal. And it, it can interact. Let me draw it the other way. It can interact with the phonon and scatter to another energy state. So this is K coming in. And this is K prime coming out. And you have to conserve both energy and momentum in the scattering process. Okay. Now, when you 
under, when you do and go to understand electron phononon scattering, this is a pretty small effect, okay? And uh, typically at room temperature, you have a lot of phonons around, and the electron might go uh, a fraction of a micron before scattering. And you go to low temperatures, and the mean free paths of electrons and copper can be centimeters. So your naive thinking here is that the electron phonon interaction is weak. Okay. But that's wrong, in fact. Because it's weak, you don't see much of it, is because you have electron, you have to conserve energy and momentum. Okay? And by doing that, because the velocities of the electron and phonon are so different. It turns out that you have a very narrow phase space where you can conserve both energy and momentum. Okay. Now, if you didn't have that phase space, this interaction here would happen in basically one to three uh, atomic distances. So that would be one to three angstrom. I mean, it would be really, really fast scattering if it weren't for this, uh, this going on. So the electron phonon strength is intrinsically really, really strong. And it's just because of phase space arguments that it's really weak. Okay. And that's something that you know you wouldn't understand the naive. Okay. So what happens is because this, this process is really, really strong, it means that there's a second order process that can come in that turns out is pretty strong too. Okay? And the process is, this scatters k to k prime. We're going to have another process where you come in with k prime. And uh, let's see, this scatters this way. Let me try to get this right. That it's going to, it's, you're going to have a scattering process that comes in here at minus k and scatters out at minus k prime. OK? And it's second order, so you go to second order perturbation theory. But because this is so strong, the net effect here is actually pretty strong. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is you know that this is k and minus k prime. This is k and minus k, and this is minus k prime and, and, and k prime. Okay. The initial and final states are, are going in the opposite direction. And this very easily uh, conserves energy and momentum. You can see I've ex explicitly uh, conserved energy. And since you emit a phonon and absorb a phonon, it's going to conserve energy too. So because this is conserved naturally, this is, this is really a big effect, even though it's second order. And what happens is the superconducting state condenses into this state where you have uh, uh, electrons of k and time reverse scattering back and forth to k prime and minus k prime. Happens all the time. And there's a huge number of states here, right? There's a huge number of electron states. This is huge. And this is, this is scattering to all these other pairs of states. And they're all scattering coherently in the same way. So you can, again, you can have a big effect because it's scattering back and forth. So these, these states here are called the Cooper pair states of, moment, of k and minus k, of time reverse states. And they're all scattering from each other. And because all, basically all these states are the same, they have zero momentum, you can do a, you can do a Bose condensation because all these states are essentially a zero momentum state, and you can condense into it. Okay? So that's why you get, uh, and even though it's a second order interaction, you can get a big effect. So you go through and you crank through that, and you can see superconductivity. And you can see that it's uh, um, the energy scale actually has to do with the, um, the by temperature of that phonon that I just unfortunately just erased. But it, it has TC and then. It has to do with how, strength, how strong the interactions are. But you can look that up. So what happens is when you write a superconducting wave function, you have all the possible k and k prime, all the possible Cooper pair states. 
And you write it in terms of the Cooper pair not being uh, um, there and the Cooper pair being there. So I'm going to write that as a CK and a C a minus K gather. Okay, onto the back of Brown's state. Okay, so this is some fancy notation, and it just means that the, the states of this is the Cooper pair being there and not being there. Okay, and if you write versus K space, you have a Fermi energy. Okay, um, so this is K Fermi. Um, below K Fermi, this amplitude here is going to basically be one. And uh, base, uh, down here, uh, this amplitude where it's empty is going to basically be 1. And of course, uk squared plus vsk squared is equal to 1. Okay? But then around the gap Tc of the, of the energy here, this is going to slowly change from 0 to 1. So for example, if you plot um, uk squared versus energy, Okay, and here's the Fermi energy. So UK is occupied, it's unoccupied at low energy, and it's occupied at high energy. For a regular metal, it would look like this. Uh, 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 yeah, well, then let me plot VK, that's easier, I'm sorry. VK, which is the occupation, it would be occupied at one below the Fermi energy and unoccupied above the Fermi energy. Okay, that's just a regular metal. And because of this kind of interaction between all the, the uh, Cooper pairs, this just gets smeared out over with KT. See, KTC. So you have that in that. Now, in, in this wave function, I haven't uh, design, I haven't written it actually quite properly yet. There's another degree of freedom that fits into here, and that's a phase here, e to the i phi. Okay? It's another degree of freedom. You can add a phase between here and here, and all the physics is the same. Provided that this phase is the same for every k. So this doesn't depend on k. But it's the same for all the Cooper pairs. Because they're scattering coherently in a both state, they all want to have the same phase state. Okay? So they have the same phase state. And this phase state is actually really important because this thing is what gives you superconductivity. Okay? So I, you're I'm familiar in, in quantum mechanics that the current, or current density, I'll call that J is proportional to the gradient of the phase. You know, so you have a plane wave state, e to the i, k, x. OK, that represents current going to the right. There's a gradient with respect to x of k. And uh, that gives you current. So this extra degree of freedom means that you can have a superconductor where there's a gradient of the phase across the superconductor and that'll carry current. Okay. And that's, you know, if it wasn't there, it would just, you would, you know, these metals condensed into an insulator state that wouldn't be very interesting at all. Well, the interesting that wouldn't be useful. The fact that it has this extra degree of freedom, uh, freedom is useful. Okay? So that's how uh, that's how that happens. Questions on that? And then what we have here is we have a, a Joseph's injunction. We have a phase on the left-hand side and a phase on the right-hand side. And we're going to call delta equals uh, phase left minus phase right. That's the difference. And you can imagine if that there's a difference between the phase, you're going to get a current from this relationship. Okay, and that's what the, eight, the, the DC relationship is, that current is proportional to the change of the phase. And instead of being the difference of the phase, it's actually the sign. And let's not go into that. That's not too hard to explain, but um, I think this, this will give you the idea that's right.
So you derive the Josephson effect and you get this. And I0 is not just some material parameter having to do with this. Now let's talk about the AC Josephson relationship. Let's say that this is voltage equals zero and this is voltage V, okay? Then when you have um, the, the, the Cooper pairs on the right hand side, there's going to be an extra term in CK that has to do with the um, gauge transformation of what happens um, when you have a voltage, right? So if there's a voltage, there's an energy EV, and uh, there's going to be an, an oscillation of this as e to the i energy over h bar. So you're going to get a term of e to the i EV h bar from this and this, and that's going to turn this into, you can remove it from these, uh, these operators and put a phi plus 2 EV over h bar. Uh, oh, this is EV energy times time, excuse me, times time, okay? So I just said that, the, that this phase is changing by 2 EV, oh, 2 EV T over h bar. Or if you look at the derivative, you can say that the derivative is going as 2EV over h bar, 2EV uh, over h bar. And that's the J.C. Josephson relationship, which relates a voltage to a derivative of the phase. Right? It's just if you have a voltage, you have an extra energy, and you have a phase from that. And that's why this basic simple argument is why the AC Josephson relationship is used for voltage standard, and you can make part per billion or better voltage standards based upon a fundamental relationship of how voltage EV is an energy. Okay. okay, there? Okay. So we have these are classical relations, V between the AC, the voltage and the current, with respect to this delta parameter, phase difference parameter across the junction. Now I want to make a very quick observation is you know that V is equal to flux dot. This is Faraday's law for an inductor. Okay? And this is very much looking like Faraday's law, only now delta is some kind of dimensionless flux. Okay? And there's a pseudo kind of flux in this system from the Josephson junction which is actually due to the kinetic inductance, the energy stored of the Cooper pairs coming through the junction. So it's not a real magnetic field, but there's an equivalent kind of magnetic field in flux from this. So because of that, I'm just going to write uh, delta as 2 pi phase or phi naught. And the reason I, I do this is that you can immediately see, see this looks like a, an inductor. You know, an inductor has I equals uh, flux over L. And if you make the flux here small, you can see sine of x goes to x, and you see a relinear relationship between current and flux. But now, because of the sine, it's turning it into a nonlinear inductor, which is what we want. Right? So you can see that the, this nonlinear current phase relationship is what's giving us the nonlinear inductor that we're going to use. Okay, that's the whole point of this. Okay? Now, one of the ways to uh, do this is to do kind of a small signal analysis. What's the differential inductance? So I take the derivative of this, I dot equals I zero, and I'm going to do a delta here, cosine delta, delta dot. And delta dot is proportional to voltage, so you have I D, I dot is equal to V over this LJ, where LJ is phi naught over 2 pi I naught cosine delta. And again, that's a nonlinear inductance. And what it says is that it's kind of zero phase across the junction. This is given by some LJ. But as the phase gets bigger and bigger, LJ gets, uh, uh, gets, it gets, the cosine delta goes down and LJ goes big. So that at pi over 2, that its inductance goes to infinity. Okay? And in fact, when this goes to pi, this is negative and you can build a negative inductance, okay? It's not that you have a nonlinear inductance, you can go from a positive to an infinite to an, an 
negative inductance, okay, which is really useful. Okay. So the last thing we want to do is compute the energy stored in that inductor. Because physicists like to think about the dynamics in terms of energy. And this is really useful. So it's just dt times the power stored in the device, which is I times V. So you plug that, you plug these formulas in, you get a sine delta, and V goes as d delta dt. And you cancel out the dt's, and you get a sine of delta d delta, which turns into a minus cosine of delta. And then you have this I naught phi naught over 2 pi. This is called the Josephson energy. So current times flux is an energy. Okay. And this energy is very interesting. Maybe I should have that plotted. Yeah, then I have it plotted. Okay, so this is phase, and this is energy. So this is the cosine, which I just minus cosine, which I just wrote there. And you see that if you compare it with a parabola, which is matched up right here, it's harmonic at the bottom, and then it flattens out because of the cosine at the top. Okay? And when it flattens out, you expect the oscillation frequency as you get bigger and bigger to go down and down. Okay? And it turns out that this cosine potential, you have a momentum term from the charge, and you have a cosine potential. That's nothing but a pendulum. That's the equations of motion for a pendulum. So at the zero, you have a harmonic potential, but then it gets anharmonic. And then maybe, you know, like here, you have an unstable point, which is, would be, you know, right here sitting at the top. So this is just the equations of motion of a, of a parabola. It's periodic, and, and you know, one, one can know how to solve this. So again, this is not, a, a, not an unusual physical situation. OK? Questions here? OK, so let's. Go ahead and uh, study that. So I've written this in terms of charge and flux, OK, to make it look like an inductor and capacitor. But you can go to dimensionless units, which physicists like to do. So charge is in units. N now is, in, uh, is dimensionless charge, and just divided by 2e. And the flux I divided by finite over 2 pi. So now we have. Something as n squared, dimensionless charge, and cosine delta. And then we have a charging energy here, which is just the energy of a single electron across the capacitor, and then this Josephson energy. Okay. So um, uh, let's, let's solve that. We want to know the oscillation frequency at the bottom of the well. So we can expand out the cosine of delta is 1, which doesn't matter, and delta squared over 2. So if you have a delta squared and an n with the ej over 2, you can basically know that the frequency is square root of k over m. And you put in the appropriate constants, and you get, or which is 1 over lj 0 c. And you get this, this uh, thing here, OK, in terms of those constants. And like I said before, so at low energy, the oscillation frequency is omega 0. And then as you go higher up in energy, you see this, uh, this is flattening out. So the energy goes down. And you can compute that classically. I think this is an elliptic integral if you want to do the math. But the mostly I just want to show here is that it goes down. Okay? And it goes down, at least initially, as 1 minus 1 eighth e over ej. But okay, you can compute it. Okay? So it's a nonlinear oscillator. Okay, which is what we want. Now, is this going to be a useful nonlinear oscillator for qubits? Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a semi-classical analysis just so that you can get a picture of how this thing works. And the semi-classical analysis is really simple. It's saying, look, if this were a linear harmonic oscillator, we would have quantum states in this well at zero point energy and then spaced by h bar omega zero. Okay? So that's our kind of unperturbed solution. And then the perturbed solution is saying, okay, if you take these energies in the well, the oscillation frequency is going to go down according to this line here. So we're going to see that as we go up one quantum state by h bar omega, this goes down by a certain frequency given by this formula. So you can write that, that this classical formula, you see the 1 eighth, 
and it goes south, and we put the quantization in this direction. And then you work through the math. Omega zero is basically, it goes down by EC over H bar for every quantum state. So the difference between here and here is EC. Okay? So that's, you know, roughly how you, you, you do it. Okay? Semi-classical. Okay. But I, I'm just trying to show you that, give you an intuition of how this thing works. Okay. Now you're going to say, wait a second, that is semi-classical. How do we know that's really true? So you do it properly. So let's do a quantum mechanics calculation. Okay? So we have the Hamiltonian. And now we expand out the cosine delta. This is the linear term. Delta squared of 2. And then there's the next order term. And there's other terms too. But let's just do this. Okay? From these two terms, we have omega 0 and we have the impedance, which is kind of a harmonic oscillator value. And then we're going to do solve for this corrections in second order. Okay? So the second order corrections are just ej times minus sine times delta to the fourth divided by 24 divided by the harmonic oscillator states, the unperturbed states. Okay? And it's just standard first order uh, quantum mechanics. Now we have to know what delta is. Remember, delta is square root impedance over rk a plus a dagger. So basically, you're going to get some constant to the fourth power times ej and a plus a dagger to the fourth power. Okay? And you can see that since you're connecting m to m, this term here, a plus a dagger to the fourth power, will have two a's and two a daggers in all the possible order combinations. And you can just crank through that. That's a, you know, that's a good student exercise. Uh, and you can just crank through, and you need to know that these two don't commute or whatever, but you can do that. So you can solve for delta EM. And then what we're interested in is the nonlinearity. So you have the, the energy difference 0 and 1, and energy difference 1, 2, and you want to have, know how much that went down. So that's E sub M minus delta E of M minus 1. That's how the energy level. And the chronic oscillator, that's 0, okay, or that's H bar omega. But here, the delta from the harmonic oscillator is now m times ec, okay, which is what we saw last time. Okay, that was you know from the semi-classical. So that's how you do the calculation. Okay. Uh, okay. So th that that gives you that. I'm going to skip over this and just. How, how would you do it numerically? So it turns out that this Hamiltonian uh, is this, the solutions are Matthew functions. So if you're theoretically inclined, you notice that, and then you spend a couple hours figuring out what the constants are and getting Mathematica to work, and you can do all that. If you're an experimentalist, you just solve it directly in 10, 20 minutes. So I think that's faster. But maybe the theorists are faster at looking things up, so it's the same thing. But this is nice. You can solve an iron problem. So I just want to say, how do you solve this numerically? And what we do is we do, to solve this numerically is we directly solve the Hamiltonian, and we do the diagonalization for the Hamiltonian. So what we do is we take a phase between minus 1 and 1 and chop it up to about 1,000 points, works pretty well. And then we have a mate that we do the Hamiltonian matrix. So since each of these points represents the, uh, the Schrodinger uh, psi at different points delta, the potential of the, of the cosine potential is just what the cosine potential is at these various points, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, the various points here. Okay? So that's diagonal, it's easy. If you have a charge matrix element, okay, in the phase basis, if you remember from the quantum mechanics, the charge is just d d delta. It's the derivative of the conjugate variable. And of course, there's an i. And here, with these dimensional units, h bar is equal to 1. Okay? And then you can just figure out what that is, uh, the, the derivative for at um, uh, delta equals delta delta 2, it's just delta 3 minus delta 1 over 2 times the 2 times the spacing here. 
So this is just the derivative matrix. And we have this minus 1 here because we want to make the wave functions continuous from this side to this side. OK? And then, you know, this is just standard, uh, you know, differentiation. Uh, and then if you want to do the second derivative, OK, for the momentum squared term, then it's just uh, uh, delta 3 minus delta 2 minus delta 2 minus delta 1, which gives you a 1 minus 2, 1. And then there's a d delta squared. So you just put in all the constants with that. And this makes it non-diagonal, so you have to just use a numerical eigensolver, but that's one line in that black code, right? So it's just essentially all the hard work is one line once you set it up. And then from that, you get the eigenstates and the eigenvectors, OK? So the eigenstates are in the light blue. So this is the zero point energy. And then you see all the energy levels up to here. And uh, this distance gets smaller as you go up, as expected. And then I plotted here the wave function squared. OK? And you see here, these wave functions, this and this and this, these are basically almost identical to harmonic oscillator wave functions, as you would expect. OK? And then it gets more and more harmonic oscillator. But then, because this is flattening out here, you still get some bound states all the way up to here. But then once you get above this, you start getting these very flat states. And these are running states where the phase is either going to the right, like this, or going to the left, like this. So that's why they come in pairs. And uh, you see, as you get to delta equal pi, the wave function goes up because it's slowing down here in the standard way. So we're not interested in any of these running charge states. We're just going to do our qubit operation right here. 10 minutes, yes. That's what we're going to do. OK. Um, so, uh, so what we do in this system, I think this is the last slide. We have our, we have our qubit, we have our capacitor drive and a voltage. It turns out a voltage and a capacitor drive is equivalent to a perfect charge bias of magnitude CC times V with this capacitance in parallel here, but this capacitance is typically a thousand times less than this capacitance, so we ignore it, okay? And then for, the, for this charge drive, the energy is equal to charge times voltage, okay? And what we're going to do, since the quantum mechanical system, this is a classical quantity, since this is a big voltage and a small capacitor, this is classical. V is quantum, and V equals Q hat over C, OK? And then I put in the Q bias, which is CC times V. I get I times V bias over Q zero point, OK? And this is kind of how hard we're driving it. CC over C says this drive is kind of isolated here, so this attenuates the drive because of this very tiny capacitor here. And then you have an A minus A dagger from the, the Q zero point here. OK? Now, that's A minus A dagger for a harmonic oscillator. But since we're just talking about a two-level system, and all the other levels are off resonance, for a two-level system, A minus A dagger times I is sigma Y. OK? So what I've done here is I've just derived the two-level Hamiltonian that the Hamiltonian is equal to a control vector times sigma y. So then we can use you know, what we review in the, the first part of the lecture to say, OK, this here is causing a rotation around the y-axis proportional to this voltage drive. Okay? So what we do in the experiment is we go to a ground state, and then we drive the qubit with a certain voltage for a certain amount of time here. And then we measure it. We start off at t equals 0 in the ground state. And then over some time, we start exciting it. So here it's going to the 1 state, and then going back to the 0 state and the 1 state. This is real data. 
And we, this has taken us like 20 years to get really good data where you see it's a nice big oscillation because our measurement is good. And you see this decays a little bit in amplitude, but not too much and due to decoherence. So it, it looks really nice. And then uh, from here to here is a pi pulse, which is a knot operation. And you see if we take this pi pulse and we double the time, a knot times a knot is identity. And if we do a pi over two pulse, that goes to zero plus zero plus one, that's you know kind of like a square root of knot. You know, pi over two pulse times a square root of knot, square root of knot is a knot. So that's kind of like a square root of knot. So we can make very good single qubits in this way. So um, I could go on and talk about two qubit operations and then measurement. There's a lot to talk about. I think we basically you know ran out of time. It's a good stopping point. But I think if you can understand kind of how the single qubit works, I think that's you know what the main object I wanted to do here. And hopefully when we listen to the talk this afternoon, whatever, you can kind of see based on this kind of how it works in a more complex situation. So that's all I have. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, so um, what happens is this anharmonicity is controlled by EC, okay? So that's, a, that's a how much uh, the capacitance is, okay? Now, you might say, oh, you want to have more and more, uh, more and more, um, we want to have bigger anharmonicity to make it more like a qubit. So that means you want to make EC bigger, okay? And then what happens is, and I had a slide on this, but I didn't want to talk about it. If you look at your wave functions here, as you make EC bigger, uh, uh, EC smaller, then um, uh, it turns out it makes the wave function in phase bigger and bigger. Okay? And then what happens is, this wave function here, because it connects to the other side, this connection is now determined also by the net charge across the qubit, which we didn't talk about. But it turns out that that charge fluctuates a lot in time, and then it'll deface and mess up the qubit and give you problems. And you have to worry about the defacing of this and a couple other states here. You have less energy levels in the well. This is wider, and you start coupling the charge noise. And then the qubits don't work so well. So we kind of get into this parameter range because here we can kind of neglect charge noise. Uh, it's a, a, a noise mechanism I haven't talked about, but it's really pretty severe, and then everything's okay. So we have to tune, we have to know what our decoherence mechanisms are and design around that. Yeah, and this was nicely figured out by the Yale group when they understood the trans one. And you know, this picture, you know, you can see how that works. Any other questions? Please. Yes. Uh, how do you exactly create one photon or two photons somehow? Okay, so what we do is we drive it with some microwaves, okay? And um, uh, when you drive with the microwaves, it's a coherent field. You're, it's, it's a superposition of all the different photon states. But in the qubit, because of the sphere geometry, when it goes from 0 to 1, you've created exactly one photon in the qubit. You've gone from 0 ground state to the first excited state. So it's the, the qubit nonlinearity and the fact that it's a two-level state that kind of quantizes the number of photons for you. That nonlinearity, that qubit state. Is that is that okay? Uh, I thought it is somehow a pulse rather than a photon. Yeah, it's a pulse, and the pulse rotates the state from zero to one, and that one state kind of represents 
one photon into the, the you know into the qubit. It's okay. one excitation. Exactly, a photon has a finite frequency, but when we talk about pulse, we have delta. Yes, yes, yes. I guess. That's right. But because it's a two-level system, <coughs> that all works properly. Yeah, it's exactly it's exactly you know one excitation. You've gone from the zero state to the one state. And it turns out that you can take that one excitation and actually transform, transfer that to a harmonic oscillator if you want. So that the harmonic oscillator has just, it, it's, instead of in the ground state, it's one state and only in one state. So you, when you have that ladder, okay, in the harmonic oscillator, you're normally in the ground state, you can transfer that quantized so that you only are excited in the one state, which is of course different than if you drive it with, uh, if you just drive a harmonic oscillator, it's in superposition of many states in a coherent state. But you can get it so that there's only one photon, which is called a Fox state. And that's an experiment we did uh, about 10 years ago, eight years ago. And the last question, how do you uh, know this state of qubit uh, before measuring it? Uh, we don't. We don't know the state. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we do this experiment. Sorry. And we do this experiment. So we put in different frequencies and we put in different amplitudes or time. And we get this curve. And when it goes from 0 to 1 back to 0, this calibrates where to do it to get exactly one photon in it, and exactly what frequency is on resonance. So we, we measure this curve and we calibrate our system to, to get it to work right. So you use microwave and the pulses to, as it draw to the deeper the state of this? Well, we, we do that. I haven't said anything about how we measure it, unfortunately. But we, we drive the system. And then we measure whether it were at zero or one. And then from that curve, we can tune everything up. But I haven't told you how we measure. I'll briefly meet, um, uh, mention that in the, the talk today. But it's, that's, a, that's about a 30 minute discussion in here. And can I have another sure. question, please? Uh, how do you differ from noise and photon? Can you have? Energy and yeah, so for example, you could have noise, and then the amplitude here will not exactly be 1. It's, it was maybe here 1, but here it's going to be a little bit lower. And this wasn't exactly 0. Okay, So we look at these curves very carefully and see how far it is from 0. And then we change a bunch of experimental parameters and change chips, and five years later we figure it out. So you just have to do a bunch of experiments to figure out what's going wrong, and then you figure out and fix it. So a priori, when it's not working well, yeah, that's the problem with experimental work, is you know you don't know what's going on, and we do a lot of work on materials and coherent and to the control or whatever to slowly figure out that's going on. And you know, actually in my notes I have uh, uh, for a day for last earlier this week I had a whole lecture on decoherence physics and what you have to do. That's a huge field in itself that I'm not talking about here. But you kind of use good materials and design things right and you know you can make it very clean. But it's, a, it's hard to know what's going on. Uh, and you talked about discrete state. What is the role of discrete state in this place in your work? So in, in the squeeze state is when you have a harmonic oscillator and you have the phase space. And uh, let's say you have a, a blob, which uh, in, in X and P, okay, uh, you would measure uh, that it had some Gaussian packet. And this would look like a displaced uh, ground state, so it's a coherent state. A squeeze state causes this blob to kind of look like this, or maybe even bigger. So that it's squeezed in this direction, so it has very little uncertainty in this direction, but big uncertainty in the other direction. So that's people, what people do in quantum optics 
And we're able to do that with that. Using the nonlinearity of the system, you can kind of generate things like that. Um, you said that you could manipulate the, the x of ui to make a, a quantum not gate yeah. effect x classically, but yeah. can we generalize it to make a, a quantum not gate that switches the probability of the states? Yeah, so those not gates change, let's say, a 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. Uh, so that changes the probability of, of, the, of the states that, you know, in, in that way. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what that's what they would do. It also works with the probability is uh, well. I mean, we have uh, zero or one, and then we change it from right. one to zero to one. But when the probability is not one or zero, like yeah, if you're if you're in zero plus one state and you run a not gate, the zero will to a one and one will be a zero, so it'll go to zero plus one. And you can do that for a time that is useful. Yeah, and let me, let me, I'll, I'll just show this. Uh, oh, yeah, that was a blank, sorry. I'll just, talk, I'll show this data right here. Right here. Okay. When you put in a pi pulse, you get a not gate. So this particular state here is 0 plus 1, which is 50% probability. And if I put in a, a not gate after that, I get right here, which is also a 0 plus 1. So you know, uh, the superposition of 0 with 1 and a not gate gets me back to 0 plus 1. The phase of the gate is, is different. You can't see that in this probability. If you were to do other things, you could see that phase, and you could see what happened. But yeah, and the fact that this is going up and down sinusoidally is very indicative that the quantum mechanics is working properly. Uh, if, if it were, you know, maybe jumping between here and here, that would be more classical-like. But the sinusoidal life is really telling you that the block vector is rotating in, in, a, in a regular way. But it's not the only thing that you do. In the beginning, we tested things in many different ways to show that it works working.